It's been five years since the Infinity Saga came to an end, and it's already quite clear that since then the MCU has not had as good of a structure to its releases, or even as good a consistency of quality. That being said, it could be way worse. Specifically, the MCU could have had the structure and average quality of the DCEU. In the past, I looked at what the DCU would have looked like if it had the MCU structure, so what if the DCEU was actually good? This time around, I'll be doing the opposite, seeing what the MCU would look like if it was as inconsistent and as as messy as the DCEU. This is something that I did do a few years ago, but that video was in desperate need of an update, both because of its quality and because the DCEU has since had a few more releases and also has since ended. So make sure to leave a like and subscribe, help me get to 100,000 subscribers, and let's begin. Before we actually get to the movies, we need to determine some of the counterparts from which we will jump off. The DCEU had access to all of its characters, and so this version of the MCU, or rather the MEU as I will call it from now on, will as well. The DCU had two primary teams, the Justice League and the Suicide Squad. Prior to the MCU, the biggest Marvel team was the X-Men, but not only is that no longer the case, and the Avengers are obviously more similar to the Justice League in concept, but also focusing on the X-Men would kind of be redundant. There is already a poorly structured and inconsistent X-Men cinematic universe that exists in real life. Speaking of the X-Men, I'm considering them the equivalent to DC's second biggest team, the Teen Titans, meaning while a few mutants could appear here and there, the X-Men themselves themselves sadly will not. As for the Suicide Squad, in concept, the counterpart would definitely have to be the Thunderbolts, but if we're looking at the MCU specifically, the franchise equivalent would be the Guardians of the Galaxy, who acted as the secondary team of the Infinity Saga. Either works, but ultimately I decided to go with the Thunderbolts, since the DCU never really ventured outside of Earth, aside from a scene or two, so the MEU won't either. Every other team counterpart I'll get around to when I get to the individual projects, but the same going for the members of each team. Also, I should should mention that one thing I won't change are the castings of the MCU. Every casting will remain the same from the MCU, which does mean that for all intents and purposes, the MEU would definitely be better than the DCEU was in real life, if nothing else because it would be perfectly cast. This isn't the only issue with the DCEU though, so there's a lot to cover. And so, the Marvel Extended Universe begins in 2013 with a movie called Captain America Super Soldier, which is a standalone origin story featuring Red Skull as the main villain basically the same plot as Captain America the First Avenger, but with the title change because they didn't yet know that they were going to lead up to the Avengers at this point, and Captain America has some different characterizations, which are, well, worse. Steve Rogers' origin would be a bit different. Instead of being chosen by Erskine for being a good man, he'd be picked because he was weak and sickly, and so he'd have a physically malleable body while also being disposable in case the experiment failed, because that's way more gritty and more realistic. And then also Steve would not be very hopeful or inspiring would be a soldier above anything else, meaning he always follows orders, wouldn't care much when Bucky seemingly dies because they have no chemistry between each other, and would fall into the ice not as a sacrifice but rather because both he and the Red Skull were just too stubborn to stop fighting, meaning Red Skull was stuck in the ice as well. Basically, the director of this movie had no idea what anything to do with Captain America meant, he didn't understand the character at all, and so the movie was just about how badass the character could be. Following the release and box office success of Captain America Super Soldier, a sequel was announced that would bring together the two main Avengers in live action for the first time. In this version though, it is also Iron Man's live action debut because unlike Batman, he doesn't really have a cinematic history before the MCU. But this movie would be called Iron Man v Captain America Civil War, and cast Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, which was considered a controversial casting at the time. While it was in development, the full MEU slate was revealed up until 2020 in 2014, which includes the likes of Thunderbolts, Thor, The Avengers, Doctor Strange, Black Panther, Spider-Man, The Avengers Part 2, Black Widow, The Incredible Hulk, Captain America 2, and Iron Man. Unfortunately, some of these movies never came to fruition, specifically The Avengers Part 2, Black Widow, The Incredible Hulk, Captain America 2, and Iron Man, and one of them only came out five years after it was supposed to, which is Doctor Strange. Then came 2016, and specifically March, and the release of Iron Man v Captain America Civil War. In this movie, Steve Rogers would be thought out of the ice 70 years later, only to find out that the world has one primary hero who has been operating for 20 years, meaning in this world he became Iron Man maybe in his 20s, and that's obviously Iron Man. In this movie, Iron Man is characterized as being incredibly serious, with no sarcasm or sassiness to him at all. And then obviously there's going to be a conflict between Iron Man and Captain America. 
On Cap's side, the conflict arises from Iron Man being a vigilante and Cap going right back to being a US government agent, basically the opposite of his motivation in the actual Civil War. On Iron Man's side, he's being manipulated by the villain Helmut Zemo, a Nazi apologist who wants revenge on Captain America for helping defeat Hydra and killing his own grandfather Heinrich Zemo, who was a member of Hydra. Zemo's plan is pretty convoluted and involves a lot of different players, including the reveal that Bucky Barnes is still alive and has been working as the brain watched Winter Soldier, specifically not for Hydra this time around, but for the Red Room, and that he killed Tony's parents. Oh, also, at one point Iron Man has a vision of a world where half of all life has died, and then wakes up from a dream only to be met by a time-traveling Doctor Strange, telling him something vague about Captain America. Anyway, it's not important. Cap and Tony fight but reconcile when Tony realizes that Cap worked with his father. Cap and Tony then team up against the Red Room and its members, including both the Winter Soldier and Natasha Romanoff, who turns against the Red Room and then acts as the equivalent to Wonder Woman in this movie, but actually in the larger MEU, she's more the counterpart to Cyborg, as she will not be getting a solo movie, and Thor is actually the equivalent to Wonder Woman. The reason I didn't include Thor in this movie is that he's just too powerful to be in this story. Unlike the DCEU, there is just Iron Man and Captain America, two pretty grounded heroes compared to someone like Thor. So adding Thor would just be out of nowhere, he just wouldn't fit at all. In the end, after failing to break through to Bucky, Captain America and the Winter Soldier actually kill each other. The other three members of the Justice League, which are Doctor Strange, Thor, and Black Panther, cameo in an email having been monitored by the Red Room. I chose those characters as counterparts to Flash, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman respectively, because they allow their solo movies to fit the plots and general intentions of the DCU movies the best, while also being characters big enough to have their own franchises, even if Doctor Strange and Black Panther aren't typical founding members of the Avengers. Then again, neither were Black Widow or Hawkeye before the MCU. One thing that I thought would be fun to do here is to flip the director's cut narrative of the DCU to the MEU. Instead of the director's cuts being longer, darker, and R-rated, the theatrical release will be all that, and that would actually be something that they'd be criticized for. They'd be too dark, but for the director's cut will be more similar to the tone of the real MCU. For this movie, the original and the theatrical cut is R-rated, three hours long, and features a cameo for Call of Obsidian, setting him up as the main villain of Avengers, while the Ultimate Edition is PG-13, better paced, and more similar to the real world The Avengers movie, as Joss Whedon intended. I think we've talked enough about Civil War, let's move on to August and see the release of Thunderbolts. Focusing on General Thaddeus Ross putting together a team of incarcerated supervillains for a mission that requires powered individuals, incentivizing them with the promise of early release, basically the exact concept of Suicide Squad. In order to determine the lineup for the Thunderbolts, I went character by character from the Suicide Squad movie, and replaced each one of them with a Marvel character who I thought worked. For instance, Amanda Waller is General Ross. Notably, the Hulk franchise is in this universe equivalent to the Green Lantern franchise, meaning, well, no Hulk in the MEU, aside from like a cameo, and General Ross is just unrelated to the Hulk in this world, kind of how like the Green Lantern Javelin appeared in the Suicide Squad, but the Green Lanterns just never appear at all. Rick Rick Flagg is replaced by Hawkeye, whose characterization from the Avengers is relatively similar to Rick Flagg, and the fact that he's not a villain but rather a hero is also fitting. The main focus would be on Taskmaster as the counterpart to Deadshot, meaning he also won't return and the counterpart to Harley Quinn, which was actually difficult to choose. Choosing the counterpart to Harley Quinn would be very important because they would go on to have their own female superhero team spin-off before appearing in the sequel as well. Ultimately, I decided to go for Elektra, who isn't similar to Harley in personality, but is similar in the fact that she is like a female anti-hero who is adjacent to a bigger male hero. Unfortunately, I found no room for Daredevil to appear, but that could be kind of similar to how Black Canary appeared in Birds of Prey, but Green Arrow never appeared in the DCEU at all, so that's kind of similar to that. I did also consider Deadpool for the equivalent to Harley Quinn, and I'm sure a lot of you did as well. He is also a member of the Thunderbolts in the comics at one point. However, that would drastically change the spin-off, which would have to be a female hero team. This time around with Deadpool, that wouldn't really work. So in the end, I decided to not go with the character who's closest in personality, but the character who would kind of fit what we need to do with Harley Quinn. Going off of Elektra, the counterpart to the Joker, because he's a mob boss in this version, will be the Kingpin. A few Iron Man villains will be included, who's the only real hero with 
with the backstory and history in this universe, so Whiplash and Ghost, as well as the Enchantress as a counterpart to Enchantress, and then a few others like White Wolf, Songbird, and Batrock the Leaper. Batrock is actually the equivalent to Slipknot because they have similar abilities, so he dies like immediately. The plot of this movie involves the Thunderbolts being brought together, then sent on a mission to fight some monsters, but it's revealed the Enchantress actually brought those monsters here. And she also brings in Surtur, who is a lot less powerful than his MCU counterpart, and then ends up being killed by a few of the Thunderbolts members. Doctor Strange cameos defeating and arresting Songbird, while Iron Man has a few moments as well in this movie, specifically chasing down and arresting a few villains, and also talking to General Ross. For years to come, the director of this movie swears up and down that if only he can release his director's cut where Elektra and Iron Man make out, everyone would then see his vision. This is actually a good movie, he swears. In 2017, we see the release of Thor, which honestly could be exactly the same as the 2011 Thor movie, with the only difference being that it's technically a sequel to Civil War taking place before that, seeing as the Red Room were aware of Thor, also, Thor does not get stranded on Asgard. Aside from that, the movie would be identical because there's nothing to change here. There's no reason why it wouldn't. Later that year came the long-awaited release of The Avengers, but along the way there are some development issues, including the departure of the original director Joss Whedon halfway through the process. The movie was then taken up by Zack Snyder, who turned it into a four-hour R-rated dark and gritty mess that is full of slow-mo. In this movie, Iron Man and Black Widow, alongside the newly introduced Nick Fury, recruit the likes of Doctor Strange, Black Panther, and Thor to help fight the incoming invasion by Cole Obsidian and the Shatari. Cole is motivated by getting the Tesseract to Thanos, which would be his final stone, so that he could snap half of existence away. Along the way, the Avengers use the Tesseract, which turns out to be the Space Stone, in combination with some strange magic to bring Captain America back to life. While doing so, Strange sees visions of the Blip, in which we get a cameo from the Hulk for the first time, and also Hank Pym appears at the end of this movie after a few dedicated minutes to the blip timeline. Before all that though, in this movie Nick Fury dies, Cole Obsidian manages to get possession of the Tesseract and goes to give it to Thanos, but the Avengers manage to stop and kill him. Thanos is now coming to Earth himself, but the old fashioned way. In terms of characterization, Tony's sassiness and sarcasm is brought in here, but it doesn't really truly land. And Doctor Strange is incredibly quirky and weird. Everyone else can be the same as they were before, or they are in the MCU. Like Captain America is still just as unheroic and uninspiring. Unfortunately, the rating runtime and poor reviews, as well as the comparisons to the 2012 amazing movie Justice League, contribute to a poor box office performance that leads to the MEU being in disarray, and Avengers 2 being cancelled. There is then no new movie for over a year, which is when Black Panther comes in in December 2018 and somehow makes a billion dollars, becoming the biggest Marvel movie ever made. This movie could have a very similar plot to the actual Black Panther movie, except T'Chaka's death would happen here instead of earlier like in Civil War, and it would be at the hands of Claw instead of Zemo, and both he and Killmonger actually survived this movie, just because Ocean Master and Black Manta both survived and then both appeared in the sequel, the same will be here. A few months later, in April 2019, Spider-Man Homecoming is released, which just as a franchise can be considered to be switched with Iron Man as the one that has a relatively recent previous live-action franchise, specifically the Raimi trilogy from the 2000s, like Batman for the DCEU. This movie would basically be a combination of the amazing and MCU Spider-Man movies, this one has origin story elements and also the villain of the amazing Spider-Man, but with everything else coming from the MCU movies, the title, the cast, supporting characters, the suit, the tone, and also the MCU references, making for a very fun experience even if it does retread old ground of Spider-Man's origin. Also, Captain America makes a cameo right at the end, meeting Spider-Man, but also his face is completely obscured because they couldn't get Chris Evans. Later that year, the non-MEU Elseworlds movie Doctor Doom is released, and then also we'll get a sequel later on in 2024. Right before the quarantine hit, Marvel managed to release in March 2022 a movie that is initially given the ridiculous title of A-Force and the Extraordinary Liberation of Elektra, then it's changed to Elektra A-Force, and then finally changed to Simple. A Force. Electra is obviously the main character, trying to assimilate to everyday life after being released from prison because of the events of Thunderbolts. She comes across a young street rat named Kamala Khan, who is a counterpart to Cassandra Kane, meaning she's nothing like her comic counterpart, including not having powers. Kamala is on the run from a mob boss named Tombstone. Along the way, Electra also teams up with Jessica.
Jessica Jones, Nico Minoru, and Dazzler, who is a mutant, but it's kind of just never addressed. Now, in the comics, She-Hulk is actually the face of A-Force, or like the leader and main character, but not only is the Hulk not around in this universe, but even if he was, I would not include her because this movie did not include Batgirl, or even Oracle, who are the faces of the Birds of Prey in the comics. Later that year, Thor Love and Thunder was released in theaters and on Disney Plus simultaneously and is absolutely terrible. Meaning for this specific movie, nothing's really changed. I did choose Thor Love and Thunder for that exact reason, because it's a lot closer in quality to Wonder Woman 1984 than The Dark World or Ragnarok. It's also closer in its concept, as both movies feature the hero reuniting with their ex. Thor Love and Thunder does come off the back of The Dark World, Ragnarok, Infinity War, and Endgame, so there are a few changes that would definitely need to be made. For instance, the Guardians of the Galaxy are not included at all, but also I do think you can kind of just cut them out of the movie and it would change nothing. Thor still has Mjolnir, meaning either he would actually lose Mjolnir in this movie and Jane would get it, and then he would get a different weapon. Oh, and beyond that, Asgard is still around, Odin and Frigga are still alive, Korg and Valkyrie have yet to be introduced. Okay, a lot would have to be different from the real world Thor Love and Thunder, but you get the gist. The core elements of the story would be very similar, and Thor Love and Thunder absolutely needs to be the equivalent to Wonder Woman 1984. They're like the worst movie in their respective universes. After several years of campaigning from Whedon fans, Disney finally agreed to release Joss Whedon's The Avengers to Disney+, Plus, which ends up being far better than the original. It's brighter, it's more fun, it's way better paced, and just generally more coherent. This is the final appearance of Black Widow and the final non-cameo appearances of Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man. Having been fired from Warner Brothers, James Gunn takes a break from his New Gods franchise to move over to Marvel to make a sequel to Thunderbolts, calling it The Thunderbolts, which releases in mid-2021. The only returning characters from the original are General Ross, Hawkeye, Elektra, and White Wolf, but White Wolf actually dies immediately in this opening massacre that involves a lot of characters. The new protagonist is Crossbones, with other main characters including US Agent, Beetle 2, the Rhino, as well as the Spot, who ends up dying, as does Hawkeye, who is killed by US Agent. That was the A team though. The B team is given primary focus in the beginning massacre, only to brutally die, including the likes of Moonstone, Mr. Fear, Nighthawk, Wrecker, Viper, and Vermin. Although Vermin actually ends up surviving, and is confirmed to return as a member of the Legion of Monsters in James Gunn's rebooted MCU. The villain here is Annihilus, stealing from the Fantastic Four. Other villains appear scattered throughout, like the Tinkerer, Radioactive Man, and Star. Now in early 2022, the one and only TV show set in the MEU is released, a spin-off of The Thunderbolts written by James Gunn, which is US Agent, focusing on John Walker going on a bit of a redemption arc as he is sent on a mission called Project Butterfly, which I don't see any reason to change because it was a completely original story with completely original characters in Peacemaker, so it could just as easily exist in a Marvel version of the show. There are a few other members of Project Butterfly who were staff working for General Ross. One specific member of Project Butterfly Butterfly goes by an alias, it's later revealed that she is actually Betty Ross, the daughter of General Ross, as an equivalent to Adebayo. Along the way, Project Butterfly is joined by Battlestar. It turns out the butterflies are aliens who are invading and things go basically exactly how they went on Peacemaker, including having one hero side with them as a counterpart to Judo Master, which would be the Swordsman. In a similar fashion, Walker also reunites with his sister, Kate Walker, who, inspired by her brother, took a super soldier serum, which turned her insane, and she is the secondary main villain as a counterpart to the White Dragon, with it being his sister instead of father. Right at the end of the season, after they defeat the Butterflies, the Avengers show up, specifically both Black Panther and Doctor Strange, as well as the silhouettes of Thor and Captain America. US Agent will go on to get a second season in 2025, but that season actually does not take place in the MEU, but rather in the MCU, with that universe change being addressed on screen. A few months after that, a non-MEU Elseworlds movie called The Wolverine, which was initially developed for the MEU but was later changed to be its own universe, is released, starting an X-Men-focused Elseworlds universe that has a few projects and then comes out simultaneously with the rebooted MCU's X-Men franchise at the same time. Later that year, the Tom Hardy-led Venom movie releases, being completely unconnected to Spider-Man in any way, because Tom Hardy didn't want it to be, and Tom Hardy promises over and over again that the hierarchy of power in the Marvel Universe is about to change. In Venom, Eddie Brock is fused with an alien symbiote that fell to Earth, which just so happened to have also been monitored and tracked by the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four works really well as the counterparts to the JSA, since they are both kind of the original superhero teams of their respective universes, and also the DCU 
student version of the JSA just so happens to consist of only four members. Also, like the JSA and Black Adam, Venom and the Fantastic Four kind of have a bit of a shared history together in the comics, as every time Spider-Man needed someone to research the symbiote, he went to Reed Richards. The main villain of this movie will be Carnage, which Venom and the Fantastic Four team up against. Dr. Fate died in Black Adam, so I kind of have to choose a member of the Fantastic Four to unceremoniously die just to prop up Venom, and so I'd go with the Human Torch, because he's the one who died at one point in the comics, he also has fire powers which symbiotes are weak to, so that would probably play into it as well. In an end credits scene, Captain America returns in his final appearance but just in a cameo, and the highly anticipated fight that everyone has always wanted to see, Captain America vs Venom, is finally teased. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately, Venom didn't do too well, and Tom Hardy's attempt to create a Marvel Universe around Venom has failed, leading to James Gunn taking over as head of Marvel Studios, cancelling Captain America's return and confirming he'll be rebooting the universe starting with a new Captain America movie starring a new actor. And that brings us to 2023, the most full and the final year of the MEU, starting actually with the announcement of the MCU, including 10 projects, 5 movies, and 5 shows, the movies being Captain America Sentinel of Liberty, later renamed to just Captain America, Iron Man, Spider-Man, Kraven's Last Hunt, The Punisher, Guardians of the Galaxy, and later on, an X-Men movie is confirmed to be in development, and the TV shows are an animated show called The Legion of Monsters, Fury, The Hulk, Iron Fist, Eyes of Wakanda, and then later on also US Agent Season 2 is confirmed, and a show called The Brotherhood of Mutants, focusing on the villains of the X-Men. The first movie released in 2023 is Spider-Man 2, or Spider-Man Far From Home, and for this case specifically, I'll be making a change to what the DCU did just to make it better. Not because I don't want to stick to the original plan, but because I just cannot fathom a universe where they make a Spider-Man movie with an original villain, which Shazam it's one thing because he only really has three villains, and every other thing that they did that boggles the mind is at least a little bit understandable, but Spider-Man has the second or maybe arguably the single most extensive rogues gallery in comic book history. To make a Spider-Man movie without a Spider-Man villain would just be absurd. More so even than every other absurd choice they made in this universe, way more. So, Spider-Man Far From Home would have the same plot as the real movie, but with the grieving Tony elements replaced with Uncle Ben, but even that is toned down. Also, the end credit scene doesn't happen. This movie kind of just comes and goes. Spider-Man Far From Home is definitely the worst movie of the trilogy. And without Spider-Man No Way Home to kind of bring it all together, this Spider-Man franchise goes out on a whimper. Five and entire years late, after years of Benedict Cumberbatch's insane antics, is Doctor Strange, in which a memory-erasing spell by Strange creates a rift in the multiverse that causes an incursion between universes, which creates a new universe with combined aspects from the others. Trying to undo the incursion, Strange meets his past self after being pushed to 2016 by an evil sorcerer, who he later learned is a future version of his younger self, who also has access to the Time Stone. Now stuck in this different universe, Strange teaches his younger self everything he learned to turn him into a sorcerer, and then decides to bring together the Avengers, but comes to find out that most of them don't exist. Now, for this movie, I had to decide who would be the counterparts to Keaton's Batman as well as Supergirl. You already saw the poster, so you know who they're going to be, but just to explain it. Supergirl, being a female hero adjacent to Superman, but also an alternate non-typical version of the character, I went with a Captain America adjacent female hero who is an atypical version of the character, so Captain Carter. As for the Keaton counterpart, obviously Iron Man is the counterpart to Batman in the MEU, but if you haven't noticed, I haven't been sticking exactly to that for everything, specifically for things that involve other franchises or past cinematic appearances, so it doesn't work for Iron Man here. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man was an option, but that would be three Spider-Man related projects in a row. Instead, inspired by Deadpool and Wolverine, which is about to come out, I decided to bring in Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, who would have been part of the X-Men trilogy from the early 2000s and one solo movie before the MEU. EU. So, when looking for Iron Man, Strange finds a grizzled old hero named Wolverine who he just doesn't recognize, and in looking for Captain America, instead finds a Captain Carter in the ice. In the end, Strange faces off against his future self, or Sinister Strange, and brings everything back to normal, only to find out that Wolverine is a member of the Avengers and Iron Man isn't. This would be a good time to discuss the intended straight to Disney Plus spin-off of Doctor Strange, which was produced, edited, and close to release before Disney's new CEO decided to completely cancel it for a tax write-off. 
The counterpart to Batgirl could be a few things, an Iron Man related character like Ironheart, a Wolverine related character like X-23, or maybe taking the fact that Cassandra Cain's counterpart is Kamala Khan, the Batgirl's equivalents could be the Marvels, in which case the movie would be Captain Marvel. If I'm being honest, I can't decide which to go with, and since it doesn't actually have any effect on the universe, I'll let you guys decide. Let me know in the comments what you'd make the counterpart to Batgirl. A movie that had a similar early development and was initially intended for a Disney Plus release but did get a theatrical release is Ghost Rider, which follows a man named Robbie Reyes succeeding Johnny Blaze as the new Ghost Rider after Johnny Blaze's apparent death. Along the way, Ghost Rider faces off against Blackheart and Johnny's brother Dan Ketch, who becomes the Death Rider, all while taking care of his wheelchair-bound brother Gabe Reyes, with help from Johnny's daughter Emma in the whole ordeal. Ghost Rider, alongside the Thunderbolt and US Agent, are considered to be loose cannon to James Gunn's upcoming MCU, meaning the actors and designs will return while similar events happened in the MCU, but not the exact same events. And finally, the MEU comes to an end with Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which focuses on T'Challa and Killmonger teaming up to defeat Claw, who has powered himself up by making a vibranium-powered suit. Now yes, I know this movie couldn't possibly be made given Chadwick Boseman's death, but this is a fictional universe, and worst comes to worst, they could just recast. Alternatively, they could just not make this movie. Maybe that is one real-world event that happened that would affect the structure of this universe, so the universe would actually end with Ghost Rider. You could decide which way you'd want that to go, and just like that, the MEU ends on a whimper. The following year, the Elseworlds movie Doctor Doom 2 comes out, and the MCU begins with the Legion of Monsters animated series as a soft launch, and the following year's Captain America as the hard launch. And finally, to finish this video off, I'll quickly list off the 30 projects which were developed for the MEU, but just never came to fruition, regardless of if they were later redeveloped into Elseworlds or MCU projects. There's The Avengers Part 2, Avengers Secret Wars, Captain America 2, Thor Ragnarok, Black Widow, The Incredible Hulk, Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, The Rhinos, which was confirmed to be a secret Killmonger's movie, Taskmaster, Jessica Jones, Elektra and Daredevil, Eyes of Wakanda, Fury, Ava DuVernay's Eternals, Daredevil, Cloak and Dagger, Silver Surfer, The Marvels, Deadpool, The Falcon, Spider-Man 2099, War Machine Armor Wars, Luke Cage, Midnight Suns, Clea, Inhumans, Squirrel Girl, Spider-Man, Miles Morales, Captain Britain, Scarlet Witch, and Iron Fist.